production of this program was made possible in part by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Commission on Minnesota Resources, the McKnight Foundation, maintaining and restoring a healthy, sustainable environment in the Mississippi River Basin, and these funding partners. At the turn of the 20th century, Minnesota was home to the largest flour mill in the world, the largest sawmill in the world, the largest open pit mine in the world, and a major metropolitan area had grown up along the banks of the Mississippi. The conversion of the natural landscape into a commercial one created prosperity across the state but the toll on the land was evident and alarming. That era was a time when tremendous change was wrought on the natural landscape. Prairies were turned over for agricultural production, and the northern forest was clear cut. From the point of view of people who love the natural world, almost a dire situation, but someone had to put the brakes on. We have to look at the whole continent to see it in its perspective. But it's in the upper Midwest where the frenzy of development and exploitation peaks and invites the response. Thoughtful persons could see that the kind of resource use that had occurred in the previous 30 or 40 years could not be sustained. Across Minnesota, people were beginning to look at the land in a different light. Men and women would call for reform in the way we used our natural resources. For nearly 70 years, lumbermen cut away at the vast forests of northern Minnesota. Millions of board feet were logged, and millions more destroyed in fires. Lumbering practices and careless settlers helped fuel these flames, including the deadly blaze in Hinckley which killed nearly 500 Minnesotans in 1894. But even this tragedy didn't slow the timber industry. Year by year, the cut inched northward until it verged on one of the last remaining old growth forests in Minnesota. Most of it was headquartered right around the upper reaches of the Mississippi in the Winnebagoshish Lake Leech Lake area around Cass Lake. This was an Indian reservation, the Chippewa Indian Reservation up there. The headwaters of the Mississippi was a vast basin of interconnected streams, tamarack swamps, sedge meadows, and majestic stands of red and white pine. Everything what you see here is mostly alive. There is a spirit there. The old people, they said there is, there is one there. <laughs> 
Treaties and reservation lines have protected more than half a million acres for the Ojibwe around Leech Lake. This was the home of the ancestors of Gerald White and his grandfather, George Gogolai. This place is really important to us. We use this place to launch our canoes when we go set net for fish. This river is usually produces a lot of rice, which is probably the reason that people have been living on this river for a long time. By the 1890s, settlers and lumber barons were casting their eyes on this rich, forested land. In 1889, Ojibwe across northern Minnesota were forced to cede their reservation lands in exchange for individual allotments of 80 to 160 acres. Of the original half million acres the Ojibwe held, they would keep only a tiny fraction, just 11,000 acres. The allotment of the Leech Lake Reservation opened up more than 200,000 acres of virgin forest and would spark the first great public debate over the fate of Minnesota's North Woods. Lumbermen, settlers, and early reformers all had their own ideas about what to do with the former reservation land. So they all had different agendas, but they were all focused on the same pieces of real estate. And you had Christopher C. Andrews, who was the forestry commissioner and, and you might say the point man for uh, forest conservation in Minnesota. Uh, at the time, Andrews was uh, over 70 years old, outspoken and vigorous. C.C. Andrews was Minnesota's first commissioner of forests, appointed to his post in the wake of the Hinckley Fire. Andrews promoted a plan to create a forest reserve on the former Ojibwe land. Here, the new science of forestry could be practiced. There is no other so available opportunity in our country for obtaining a considerable tract of original white pine forest for scientific management as here. C.C. Andrews, 1898. Scientific forestry arose in reaction to unregulated timber cutting, and it was an attempt to find a middle ground between decimating our national forests through clear cutting them and preserving them from any use whatsoever. C.C. Andrews would be joined by a new and powerful set of allies. You had the General Federation of Women's Club who seized on this issue in part because they were a rising force politically. <laughs> women did not have the right to vote or to hold office. One of the ways in which women across the country were asserting themselves was to demonstrate that they could be players in the political process. And so here in Minnesota, they seized on this particular issue. This is an urgent and uncompromising note of warning. Lumbering operations and the devastating fires that follow in the wake of the destructive slashings have now approached the borders of the ceded Ojibwe reservations. State pride, health, and recreation demand that this opportunity shall not pass without action towards the creation of a permanent forest in Minnesota. The Courant, 1900. While people in the Twin Cities pushed for the creation of a forest reserve, those who lived near the northern forest had other ideas. For the most part, people in northern Minnesota were still committed to farming the cutover land. The settlers in around Cass Lake, they had just moved in within the last decade. They were farming the cutover land. They were utterly opposed to the idea of locking up this land. They wanted development. The lumbermen and others 
right? We saw this as a resource that we could use to continue to feed lumber down to the sawmills in Minneapolis. But the people who wanted to see the area preserved said, well, if you cut down all the trees, we won't have anything left. The fight continued over four long years. Finally, advocates of a forest reserve negotiated a compromise with settlers and lumbermen. They had to placate local interests and assure them that settlers would not be thrown off their lands or that settlement and development would come to a halt. They had to reassure lumbermen that there would be lumbering, although it would be conducted under sound forestry principles. Logging companies were required to show uncharacteristic restraint. All slash had to be piled and burned. 5% of the trees were left uncut to reseed the forest in the wake of lumbering. And tall trees along shorelines were left for purposes of beauty and recreation. Though modest by today's standards, these limits were considered radical by the lumbermen of the day. With the support of President Theodore Roosevelt and his chief forester, Gifford Pinchot, legislation creating the Chippewa National Forest passed the U.S. Congress in 1902. The Chippewa National Forest was among the first of many managed forests in Minnesota, but it had other far-reaching significance. Its creation marked a shift in the way some people viewed the land. The Chippewa is a place where we held back when we had every good reason to bulldoze further forward. And so it's almost symbolic where it sits there in the middle of uh, Minnesota and in the middle of the continent. this West Point, perhaps the point politically and economically and philosophically, we returned the tide. We began to think of these places and these communities in a different way. Right here where we are uh, on the Mississippi River, just below St. Anthony Falls, uh, 200 years ago, this would have been a huge whitewater rapid. And then as that river turned and made the, the big S curve through what's now St. Paul, the river would have slowed and there would have been some deeper, slower pools. Some broad sandbars, backwater lakes, emergent marshes. So an incredible diversity of habitat. They estimate around 150 years ago there was 120 species of native fish that lived here in the Mississippi River. And the water would have been clear. And it, and it would have just been an amazing sight. The Mississippi and the Falls of St. Anthony fueled spectacular growth in the cities of St. Paul and Minneapolis. At the turn of the 20th century, they were expanding even faster than Chicago. 
quarter of a million people now lived and worked near the banks of the river. The industrial activities that were occurring along the riverfront, of course, were dumping all of their waste into the river. Sanitary waste is going into the river, I and mean, basically everything that is garbage in any sense is going into the river in the late 19th and early 20th century. And there really wasn't any hue and cry about that. You know, people regarded rivers as you know, things that would sort of take stuff away. So you put it in and take it away. And you don't actually worry about what's going on in Des Moines or St. Louis or what. I mean, that's not your concern. It wasn't just industries that dumped waste in the river. At the turn of the 20th century, garbage and sewage were still an individual responsibility. Most often, refuse was dumped in an alley, and human waste accumulated in an outhouse behind a home. In poor neighborhoods like St. Paul's Swede Hollow, sanitary conditions were abysmal. Outhouses were perched along Phelan Creek so that waste would flow directly out of the neighborhood. A major crisis in public health reached a peak at the turn of the century. The diseases that were carried by dirty water were a problem in every city. serious disease like the cholera outbreaks or things of that sort, that was just a part of life. Living and working conditions in the Twin Cities appalled the Minnesota Federation of Women's Clubs. They joined with the Minnesota Board of Health to call on one of the most prominent urban sanitation experts of the day, Carolyn Bartlett Crane. She came to Minnesota in the fall of 1911 to conduct a sanitary survey of the Twin Cities. Her lectures and reports on public health conditions were widely covered in the press. We certainly should keep our city, that is to say, our common house, clean. The floor should be clean. The air should be clean. There should be sanitary collection and disposal of all the waste that inevitably accumulate wherever human beings have a home. Carolyn Bartlett Crane. Reformers called for the expansion of a city's wide sewer system more than a thousand miles of sanitary sewers were laid in the next 20 years. So the first sewage systems were built to pipe the human sewage directly to the river, untreated. And uh, it just fell out of the pipes and was flushed away. Dangerous waste was now carried away from homes and businesses. Public health improved dramatically. But by the early 1930s, the Twin Cities were home to nearly a million people. It was a problem. It started to degrade the river. There was a story of, of uh, the, one of the small reservoirs below here above the Ford Dam. The sewage had accumulated on the bottom in a big sludge mat. And on a hot day, it decomposed, created methane gas. The whole mat rose to the surface and started venting methane gas. Neighborhoods had to be evacuated from the riverbank. Neighborhoods below South St. Paul were particularly hard hit. Their stockyards situated along the banks of the Mississippi River slaughtered tens of thousands of animals each week. All the remains were flushed directly into the river. A crisis was brewing. A series of water quality investigations were launched in the late 1920s and 30s. In the summer of 1926, the U.S. Bureau of Fisheries did a fish survey along 
the entire length of the Mississippi from St. Paul, Minnesota down to Red Wing. And in that entire 40 mile length of river, they only found three fish. condition of gross pollution exists. The water of the Mississippi is not safe to drink, not safe to swim in, not safe to eat the fish, and poses a danger to livestock who come in contact with the water. Minnesota State Board of Health, 1928. Reformers and public health officials soon called for the creation of a sewage treatment plant. Depression-era spending made possible the construction of the largest such plant along the entire length of the Mississippi. For the first time in the city's history, sewage would be treated before it was dumped into the river. As soon as the metro plant was built and came online in 1938, the entire stretch of the Mississippi River above St. Paul improved very dramatically and very quickly. By the late 1930s, the stretch of the Mississippi through the Twin Cities had been brought back from near extinction. It no longer posed a dire threat to human health. Yet in the decades to come, new challenges would face the Mississippi, and there would be continued calls for reform. In this area, there are 250,000 acres of water. Down below is one of the last remaining wildernesses in the Middle West one of the world's greatest canoe regions, with virgin pine forests and a labyrinth of waterways. Although we have come by air, the region is accessible by automobile traveling on paved highways. During the 1920s, the automobile opened up new vacation destinations. Now, each summer, Minnesotans could flee the city and head up north. Among the more popular places to visit was the Superior National Forest in Minnesota's Arrowhead region. Here lay one of North America's greatest wild places, a timeless landscape of rugged granite-rimmed lakes, deep forests, and misty rivers called the Boundary Waters. It was Minnesota's last remaining wilderness, and the last of the state's great lumber barons, Edward Wellington Bacchus, had his eye on it. Bacchus was a self-made man. He grew up on a farm near Red Wing, Minnesota. He uh, started out as a bookkeeper. He was smart, very intelligent, and he was visionary. He told a very charming story about snowshoeing north from uh, Brainerd, Minnesota in the winter of 1898 with a timber cruiser, just the two of them. It was 40 below and the wolves were howling. And he said, I came upon a wonderful sight of these great falls. And he recognized that uh, his destiny lay there. The waterfall that so impressed him was Kuchiching Falls. Draining more than 14,000 square miles of the Rainy Lake watershed, it was a natural wonder. There was more water power here than at the Falls of St. Anthony. He saw their beauty in the moonlight. He talked about that. But what he really saw was an enormous amount of water power. Mm -hmm. 
In 1908, he completed construction of a dam that became the major source of electricity in the region. The falls also powered the fourth largest newsprint mill in the nation. The appetite for paper in the early 20th century was immense. The appetite for electric power was also immense, and it was a growing uh, industry. The little village of International Falls was transformed into an industrial giant, and Edward Wellington Backus became a millionaire. By the mid-1920s, he was said to be worth $100 million. He also had great political clout, uh, especially within the Minnesota and National Republican parties. He had kept a little black book, they said, in which he kept a record of fairly heavy contributions to both sides of the aisle. Bacchus had a great deal of influence. He also looked the part of the 19th century lumber baron with his silver hair and mellifluous voice and his rather arrogant attitude toward everything, which was tempered in part by a disarming charm. By the 1920s, Edward Backus controlled the natural resources of an area the size of New Hampshire, Vermont, and Massachusetts combined. But he wanted more power for his mills, more water flowing over his dam at International Falls, and even greater control of the boundary waters. But he was about to meet his match. Ernest Oberholzer was an unlikely outdoorsman. He was a classically trained violinist who attended Harvard, where he studied philosophy and landscape architecture. Oberholzer came to the Boundary Waters region for the first time on a brief canoe trip in 1906. He thought the rigors of the journey might strengthen his heart, damaged in youth by rheumatic fever. He returned for a second, more adventurous journey after his graduation from college. He wanted to uh, travel all the portages and waterways of the Rainy Lake watershed. It's described as his 3,000 mile summer. And so in one year of 1909, he was able to cover an enormous range of this huge watershed and moved from this tenderfoot status to someone who was sort of an interpreter of the entire region. This is one of the rarest regions on the continent, if not the world. Nowhere else is to be found so precious and picturesque a combination of water, rock, and forest, all linked together in a single maze of bewildering beauty. Ernest Oberholzer. Eventually, Oberholzer made his home on a one-and-a-half-acre island in Rainy Lake. Bob Hilke was a lifelong friend of Oberholzer's. Ober seemed to me like a, a magical person. He was uh, not very big. Uh, he was uh, very fit. I mean, he could uh, carry heavy loads, uh, he climbed around on these rocks and all over the place like it was nothing. He'd be up early in the morning and then maybe going down fixing breakfast for those that were on the island. Always had guests here, it seemed. And uh, his stories uh, were always being told. In time, the collection of cottages and sheds known as Mallard Island became a legendary Northwood Salon. Friends from his days at Harvard, who included the historian Samuel Eliot Morrison and the poet Conrad Aiken, joined Oberholzer and others for summer gatherings on the island. In 
When he wasn't entertaining guests, he visited with his Ojibwe neighbors. He spent many hours collecting their stories and photographing their way of life. Yet the canoe country, and this culture he had come to love, would soon be threatened. It was in 1925 that Edward Backus proposed building a series of storage and power dams along the international border. The whole idea would be to so harness and regulate the waters in that watershed so that he would have, he could augment his electrical power at International Falls. Ernest Oberholzer and others living in the Rainy Lake watershed had already felt the effects of Edward Backus's dams. Oberholzer had spent many summers assessing and photographing the environmental consequences. He noted damaged shorelines and timber stands, as well as the way flooding hurt local farmers and resort owners. Now, Backus was proposing a series of dams that would affect the entire watershed. Waterfalls would be replaced with concrete dams. Many large lakes would be raised from 12 to 18 feet. And thousands of islands would be submerged. Bacchus enthusiastically promoted his scheme. The benefits to the people of Canada and the United States may be briefly summarized. Navigation will be improved. The scenic beauty of the streams and lakes will be enhanced, and they will become more accessible to tourists. Uniform water levels will improve fish, fowl, and game. New wealth will be created. Any lands affected by the waters of Rainy Lake are not of value enough to consider. Edward Wellington Backus. Because the region is largely in a state of nature, Mr. Backus assumes that it's valueless. But that is exactly what constitutes its value to the public. Ernest Oberholzer. Many others would come to share Oberholzer's fears for the Boundary Waters. Sewell Ting was a young up-and-coming Wall Street attorney and frequent visitor to Mallard Island. He often canoed with Oberholzer and shared his love for the region. Mr. Ting was as much disturbed as anybody by the prospect of what was going to happen to these wonderful canoe waters. We were very much alarmed. Mr. Ting had said, we're just like a lot of farmers with pitchforks against a man with a Gatling gun. Ting and Oberholzer were part of the generation that had lived through and been shaped by World War I. Those who survived the war came home and for the first time they had had a taste of the outdoor life and they liked it. And many of these men had also been taking canoe trips and, and outings in uh, the Superior Forest and realized that if Bacchus succeeded, the places that they had most so recently enjoyed would be gone. wilderness becomes a resource. And people begin to think of it as a resource because it's disappearing just as the white pine had disappeared and just as gain populations had disappeared. So in fact were large tracts of undeveloped land uh, beginning to disappear. By the late 1920s, there was mounting public pressure to protect the Boundary Waters region. Oberholzer and his associates were joined by major conservation groups like the Isaac Walton League and the Federation of Women's Clubs. 
1927, a new conservation organization was formed. The Quetico Superior Council was created to fight Bacchus and the proposed dams. Ernest Oberholzer was called on to spearhead the fight. And so with a fair amount of reluctance, Oberholzer left Rainy Lake and moved down and took an apartment in Minneapolis to make speeches, to raise money, to contact the influential people write letters, which he did. And he was charming, he was personable, he was brilliant when it came to networking people together. Ernest Oberholzer and the Quetico Superior Council soon realized that the only way to completely stop Edward Bacchus and his plans to flood the region was through federal legislation. They would have to take the fight over the boundary waters to the floor of the United States Congress. And then, in the late 1920s, he and others helped to shepherd a bill called the Shipstead Nolan Bill in the United States Congress. It was a very dicey struggle to get it through. There were all kinds of forces brought to bear to keep this from happening, especially promoted by Edward Wellington Bacchus. And sometimes when they met in the halls of power, why he would say condescending things to Ober, he would say, are you still climbing the beanstalk? Which is kind of strange, because when we, when we know the outcome of their circumstances, that in fact, uh, he was the giant that fell. Despite an enormous amount of time and money spent lobbying in Washington, Edward Bacchus lost his fight on the floor of Congress. The Shipstad Noland Act passed in the waning days of the 1930 session. There would be no flooding of shorelines on public lands in a 4,000 square mile region of the Boundary Waters. And forests on lakes and rivers would be preserved throughout the area. The boundary waters had been saved from destruction. The long battle to preserve the region as a wilderness could now begin. I believe John Muir was the first person to talk about wilderness as a university. And over added a line I think that was quite wonderful. He, he said, it's a university where the other half of wisdom is, uh, is taught, that, that greater part of wisdom uh, that can't be taught indoors. Such lands, wrote Oberholzer, would link us with a primeval past, promising sanctuary for all time to unborn multitudes. The deepening of the Great Depression and the fight to dam the Boundary Waters destroyed Edward Bacchus's empire. Yet he had played a key role in the effort to protect the region. If Edward Bacchus hadn't had his overweening pride in this, this enormously ambitious plan, sometimes described as the greatest water power plan in United States history, if that hadn't happened, the sort of forces of opposition wouldn't have emerged. And so, in a way, Bacchus is responsible for the, the energy of preservation. Uh, and Ober recognized this uh, when Bacchus died alone in his hotel room in New York City. I heard of it suddenly. Two or three telephoned me, joyously. It didn't affect me that way at all. I felt the other way. Of course, I said jokingly to people, well, now we have lost our best friend because we haven't got anyone to quarrel with. But I will miss Edward Bacchus. <laughs> <laughs>
before he became a noted writer and conservationist, Sigurd Olsen joined a team of game wardens on their rounds. Their job? Killing wolves. It was New Year's Day, the beginning of a long trek. We were bound for the Fraser Lake country to make the round of a line of poison bait set out some weeks before. Our trail lay along one of the finest big game areas on the continent, and incidentally, one of the most harassed by the killing packs. This was but a phase of the warfare between predatory animal control and the hosts of gray marauders, which each year descend from the wilds of Ontario. Sigurd Olson, The Poison Trail. Minnesota's diverse habitats had once been home to an abundance of wildlife. Yet in the decades following European settlement, wildlife numbers plummeted. Beginning in the 1920s, concerns about Minnesota's game populations would lead to new efforts in conservation. Like most conservationists at the time, Sigurd Olson was certain that killing predators would help restore a big game to the state's north woods. Predators were thought of as, uh, as the really bad kid on the block. And, and the state had bounties, predator bounties, way back into the 1850s and 1860s. And the state conservation department paid bounties on everything from timber wolves and mountain lions and badgers and pocket gophers and rattlesnakes. And all of those bounties persisted quite a while. State game wardens were given license to kill all the predators they could. And some hunters made their living collecting bounties. In Rosso County, clubs were formed to kill wolves. In one winter alone, more than 800 wolves were trapped, poisoned, or shot. Predator control was not the only effort made to restore game populations. Sportsmen and conservationists tried numerous other strategies. There are all these restrictive approaches that are taken. We will enact stricter game laws and bag limits and such things. We will wipe out predators that will allow game species to, to proliferate. We will create these refuges that will give them a safe haven so that hunters can then harvest the overflow. Well, those are all restrictive and negative in their approaches. None of the early conservation efforts significantly improved wildlife numbers. All failed to account for profound changes in the land. Well, wildlife populations really changed in the late 1800s and the early to mid 1900s, basically due to the change in habitat as forests were cut and prairies plowed, habitat was destroyed and populations continued to plummet. But one landscape had remained relatively untouched. The vast network of shallow lakes, marshes, and potholes in the western third of the state. The thing that's most significant about the potholes in a national context is they're the place where most of America's waterfowl breeds. In its original state, the prairie pothole region stretched from southeastern Alberta in the northwest 
to Iowa in the southeast. About 80% of the waterfowl in this country breed in this one area. From all the four flyways, birds converge upon the wetlands. These potholes, they're actually like bowls of soup or something. They're filled with all sorts of little organisms, invertebrates, snails, worms, just the things that ducks love to eat. Not much cover here, but bang goes the shotgun and the duck season has been open. It looks like plenty ducks, mallards, canvasbacks, redheads, big boys all. The limit in Minnesota, 12 ducks a day, 36 in possession. Even as the state promoted the glories of duck hunting, Minnesota's wetlands were in jeopardy. In the late teens and early 20s, booming agricultural markets encouraged farmers to expand fields. In western Minnesota, the last tracts of potential farmland were prairie potholes and wetlands. A drainage craze swept through the region with devastating effect as farmers drained wetlands to create new fields of corn and wheat. Breeding, nesting, and feeding grounds were destroyed. There were more hunters in the field and fewer birds to hunt. In 1928, a major hunting organization hired a researcher to conduct a field study of game birds in the upper Midwest. And so beginning in 1928, old Aldo Leopold takes off around the Midwest to begin the process of documenting the actual populations and the places they live. Aldo Leopold would lead the way in bringing the new science of ecology out of the lab and into the field. Leopold's groundbreaking work in the 1920s and 30s ushered in the era of modern wildlife management. It's a chance to understand what's actually going on out there with these populations of animals and with the habitats that they exist in. No one had done that before. It was old wives' tales and, and rumors and anecdotal accounts. There was no data. There was no science to build on, and it had to begin somewhere. Just a few years later in northern Minnesota, Sigurd Olson set out to conduct the first scientific research on wolves in the wild. He'd come a long way from the poison trail. If a government ranger makes a report that timber wolves kill a deer a week, it is accepted as fact, and immediately any program to eliminate this menace to wildlife is heartily endorsed. Because there has been no attempt to disprove these theories, the campaigns of extermination go unchecked. Sigurd Olson. He stepped back from looking at the wolf as, as a pure bad guy and tried to think of, okay, this is one piece of this whole system here, and how does it fit in? Aldo Leopold was making the same intellectual journey as Sigurd Olson. Leopold's view on predators shifts 180 degrees. 
begins in the teens, 1920, thinking, as did most people of his generation, that the only good predator is a dead predator. And by the early 1930s, he's almost saying that as conservationists, we need to be conserving the entirety of the community of life from the predators on down to the plants, down to the rocks and soils, because they are all interrelated. What happens to one level will happen and echo through the rest of the system. In an essay called Thinking Like a Mountain, Leopold described the change. He recalled shooting a wolf and approaching the dying animal. We reached the old wolf in time to watch a fierce green fire dying in her eyes. I realized then, and have known ever since, that there was something new to me in those eyes. Something known only to her and to the mountain. I was younger then and full of trigger itch. I thought that because fewer wolves meant more deer, that no wolves would mean hunter's paradise. After seeing the green fire die, I sensed that neither the wolf nor the mountain agreed with such a view. Aldo Leopold. I think in the teens and the 20s in the United States, there was a premonition that things were connected and that we were dealing with a very complex system. And if we're going to protect wildlife, we would also have to protect forests. And that is a basic application of this brand new and highly revolutionary science of ecology. But it's moving it out of the scientific realm and into the public arena. What does this science mean for the way we live in these places? For the first time, we ask ourselves not how can we take things from these systems, in fact, but how can we begin to rehabilitate them? Just 40, 50 years before this, we were ripping up the prairies and converting them to agriculture. Beginning in the 30s, we begin the first time to say, how can we put these back together? That's a very short historical arc. It's a revolutionary time. In the decades to come, Minnesotans would continue to make monumental changes in the land. But there were increasing calls to stop and listen. I have heard the singing in many places. I have heard it on misty migration nights when the dark has been alive with the high calling of birds. And on cold winter nights when the stars seem close enough to touch. I have discovered that I am not alone in my listening. That almost everyone is listening for something. That the search for places where the singing may be heard goes on everywhere. Sigurd Olsen. <laughs>
Production of this program was made possible in part by the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund, as recommended by the Legislative Commission on Minnesota Resources, the McKnight Foundation, maintaining and restoring a healthy, sustainable environment in the Mississippi River Basin, and these funding partners.